Shabbat Shalom. Sahorayim Tovim. Good afternoon. Baruch Hava. Welcome to our Hebrew class, our beginner Hebrew class, or as they would say in college, Hebrew 101. Point A. All right. So, um, and for those who are here and those who watch online, uh, we apologize that it's a little disjointed sometimes uh, because things happen and so um, this week we're studying the letter K two weeks ago we studied the studied the letter Dale um, then so Ciro was out of town last week and I did the teaching so I was too worn out to do the do the class uh, so and then we're going to be out of town for two weeks so it just it sometimes it seems like you know you have problems getting the keeping the momentum going but just stay with it and what you can do in the interim is practice because all of this does you no good at all if you don't practice it the only way you learn you really learn i'm just explaining to you what the letters are how to pronounce it what they signify those kinds of things so you have some understanding of what you're doing but the only way that you're actually going to learn it is to practice it. And you say, how do I practice it? Well, for one thing, go back over the videos and look at what you've already learned. Okay? Uh, and just go over them a few times. The other thing is, um, I gave you instructions to write them down. To write a full page every day of what you know so far. Okay? Uh, so that you get used to seeing it, so that you get used to feeling it, so those, and then and then practice saying it. And there are Hebrew sources online um, where you can look, start looking for the letters, identifying the letters. All right, that's a that's an aleph. All right, that's a bit. All right, that's a vit. All right, that's a, you know it's a bit. Without the dagesh, that's a, and you can you can start uh, identifying the letters. Okay, so so start practicing because very shortly we're we're at the fifth letter, uh, soon to be the the sixth letter when we get back, um, and the seventh letter. And you've got enough letters already to start making words, to start forming words. So we're going to start throwing vowels in, at you now. Not this week, but when we get back, we're going to start throwing vowels at you because the letter Vav, the sixth letter, actually serves as both a consonant and two vowels. So it's, there's actually three letters in the one. Okay, so uh, we're going to start throwing vowels at you. So it's... It, we're getting to the point where we can start forming words, putting words together. I've already showed you how to to form Abba, Father, uh, Beit, House, and we've talked about several different words. Uh, we give you uh, we give you when we give you the name of each letter, it's spelled out in Hebrew. We spell it out for you in Hebrew, and so um, each each letter has its own significance, its own defining term. And so you need to learn those things because that's t that's what tells you what the word means. Um, I've often said before in other classes, I've often said that it takes three, four, sometimes five English words to truly define a single Hebrew word because you have all of that definition going into the word. So that's why where in English love is not English love is an emotion, where Hebrew it's much more than emotion. It's action. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. We're going to learn a word called gerund. Say gerund. G E R U N D. G E R U N D. How many of you have ever heard of a gerund? You know what a gerund is? It's a part of speech. 
Okay, it's part of part of language. And we're going to talk about that today. All right. Before we get in depth, one more uh, little uh, short. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. Uh, I was reading my I was reading my morning devotions a few weeks back, and there is a. Um, a source called Tanya. Everyone say Tanya. And Tanya is are are the Tanya are the thoughts of the original uh, Chabad Rit, the founder of Chabad, um, back in the late 1700s and so it's called the, the the name of the source is is tanya and these are basically it's a book made out of his his uh what's the word i want re, 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 remunic, reminations on on his thoughts on different topics i was i was very surprised because one of the things that rabbis today and Jews today will tell you is they don't believe. Number one, they are they they have a problem with Yeshua being Mashiach to begin with. When you say that he is divine, that is, he is Hashem in the flesh, taking on taking on human form. That just blows them away. They have much difficulty with that. And that's one of the things they have against us. One of the major things that they have against us. So, they will tell you, we've never believed that. They will tell you that we've never believed that, that, that you know, and they accuse us of idolatry. Uh, you know, you have three gods and all of this kind of stuff, and and they will. I, I, I've debated with rabbis before, dis had discussions with them, and one of the things that they always, how can God fit into a human being? How can God fit into a human being? Well, Rabbi Schneerson, the original Rabbi Schneerson, the founder of Chabad said this but as for the Shekhinah itself remember that the Shekhinah is the Rach HaKodesh namely the origin and core of the manifestation whereby the blessed Ein Sof illumines the worlds in a revealed form and which is the source of all streams of the vitality of life it's in, this is in chapter 52 of uh, Likute Amarin. What he goes on to say, I took a I took a screenshot of it so that I could save it. What he goes on to say is this: because the people could not bear, you were talking about this a few weeks ago. The people could not bear the presence of God, the glory of God. He clothed himself within the Shekhinah. The Shekhinah was a visible form of God so that they could see but that he would not destroy them with the full blast of his glory. So he shielded himself within the Shekhinah. All you have to do is apply that to Mashiach. You see, if he can encapsulate himself in a cloud of fire, 
or in a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud, if he can encapsulate, why can he not encapsulate himself? This is why they this is why the rabbis don't like us studying their works. Because when they tell you we've never taught that, it's not there. It is. All you have to do is just open your eyes so you can see it. Question, yes? Good. Yes. 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 If you remember what I taught you last week during the, during the teaching um, on the menorah about the ark, that the ark encapsulated the Torah. The Torah, the, 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 the tablets, that was the heart of God. That's the heart. That's the mind. That's the spirit. So that's the heart of God, encapsulated within the Aaron, the ark. So when people say, well, I want to know the mind of God, well, read Torah. There it is. You have it. When you want to do the will of God, well, do Torah. That, that's it. All right. So now there was a reason why I'm telling you all of that, and we'll get to it in just a minute. All right. So let's go. We have here the Aleph Bet chart, uh, if you can see. So you have the start there. Aleph, Bet, Vet, Gimel, Dalit. Hey, we're going to stop there because here's what we're doing today. Ready? Do it again. Aleph, Bet, Vet, Gimel, Dalit, Hey. Notice what's the difference between the Bet and the Vet. The Dagesh. There's no Dagesh in Vet. Okay, so it softens it. So it becomes a B. It's called a Labio. Okay, we'll talk about Labios. A Labio is off of the lips. Okay, so how do you say lip in Spanish? Okay, so so it's off of the lips. So it's a sound that comes off of the, it's created by the lips. So a b, a v. You also have p and f. These are created off of the lips. So these are called labials. All right? Off of the lips. Okay, so aleph, bet, vet, gimel, dalit, he. Again, aleph, bet, vet, gimel, dalit, he. Now you have the sounds underneath. So aleph is... Bet is, vet is, gimel is, dalit is, and he is, okay, he is, so, uh, next slide. So today we're taking up he. Let me get back to where I'm supposed to be. All right, so today we're taking up he. Last week was dalit, or two weeks ago was dalit. We're not going to go back over it. The video is there. If you need to review, go back and review. All right. So the sound of hey, that's the hey up at the top. This is the paleo. Hey. All right. So if you want to know what the hey, and 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 it's gematria is five. The number is five. It's the fifth letter of the Aleph Bet. So Aleph Bet Gimel Dalit Hey. All right. So it's the fifth letter. So it's the number five. So sometimes hey will be the consonant of the H sound, and then, or sometimes, depending on it's where it is, sometimes it's the number five. Okay, um, one of the prayers that we do, one of the uh, one of the songs that we sing in the beginning of the siddur, of the beginning of the liturgy, you'll notice that it has each of the each of the letters of the aleph bit. It starts with each letter of the aleph bit, and so there's 22 verses to that song. The same is true with uh, Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is made of oct uh, octanes. That is that there are eight verses. Um, there are 22. There are 22 sets of eight verses. Okay. But what is very curious about it is that. Each of those verses, each of those, each of those sets, 
starts with the next letter of the alphabet. So the first first set of eight, it all starts with aleph. Everything starts with aleph. The next set, everything starts with bet. The next set, and so you'll see it divided in your Bibles. Even you'll see it divided by the aleph, bet, gimel. That and that's what it's meaning. It's meaning one. This is verse one, verse two, verse three, verse four, verse five down to twenty-two. Okay. But then, then David Hamelik, he's the one who wrote it, wrote, the, came up with this song, uh, this psalm. Um, so he decided, okay, I'm going to have 22 verses, and each verse is going to start with that letter of the olive bit. So pretty cool. That's that's that is poetry in Hebrew. Okay. So the sound of next, the sound of of he is breath. Your breath to breathe. It is close, it is near, it is near to silence, yet it is not silent. It is simply quiet. Now you're going to find there are a lot of words in Hebrew that end with he. Their tendency is to skip over to to not say it. We're going to talk about her name in just a moment. Sarah. But the he is there. The he is there. Why is the he there? It has a voice. It has a voice. It's there. And it is to be spoken. It is to be said. So when the he appears at the end of a word, Make sure that you give it its due. She's there for a purpose. She's there to give breath. Sarah. It's not just Sarah. It is Sarah. When you hear a good Israeli speaker speaking, you will hear those little breaths at the end. Where the hay is. So make sure that you give their due. I had an English professor in one of my college courses. So we have a word, let's say very simply, there versus. Two different words with two different meanings, actually two different spellings. Yet, in modern English, we say them the same. But you see, in Old English, they were not pronounced the same. That's why they're spelled differently. They did not sound the same. The reason in English why a letter is there is because it's pronounced. That was the rule. So this would be the ear, the ear, the ear. Now when you hear old mm, Saxon, old Saxon accent, which is the Saxons and the Angles were two Teutonic tribes, Germanic tribes that invaded Britain. Right after the Romans, Romans left. And that is much of what we think cons as the English accent. But the heavy brogue of, the, of, of Saxony is slightly different because they pronounce the, you'll hear it also in, in Scottish brogue, in the, 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 
um, accent of Scotland, sometimes Ireland, I guess, where they hit, because you see that ear is actually two syllables, that ear. You'll notice on this one, you have this here, and we call that what? The silent E at the end. Why is that E silent? It was not always silent. In ancient English, that would be vele. Over vele. And you can still hear it in England today, you can still hear traces of it when the people begin speaking in their own brogue, in their own local dialects. You can still hear some of these things. So where you have the silent E in modern English, well, it wasn't always silent. And so I had this English professor teaching us this. That when in English you see a word, a letter in a word that is not pronounced, why is that letter there? Because at one time it was pronounced. It has just fallen. The pronunciation has just, we slur the words. So instead of they here, we say there. You see, we, we trash it up. Instead of saying there, we say there. So now you have there and there. And then just to add to the mix, you also have there. So there. Don't get me going. All right. So. We'll come to, we'll, we'll see this in just a minute. So this is Sarah. In Hebrew, sin, resh, he. But the he is there. <laughs> so it's Sarah. Sarah. You have to let it out. You have to let it breathe. So don't shortchange the words with the hey that end in hey. All right. Now, we need to be careful. You need to, you need to make a distinction because there are two letters that look exactly alike, exactly alike, except one has an opening, and the other is closed. This is he, and this is he. And we'll get to that he later. Okay? This is he, this is he, and this is he. Like K-H or C-H, and mostly you'll see the English transliteration as C-H, but it's a K-H sound. It's an airy K. Ch, Okay. So the he is open. Why? <gasps> Breathe. This is the, this is the, man, I need a pointer. This is the throat. And the throat is open. With the het, this is the throat. See, the throat is open. So the air breathes, flows freely. Where with that chet, it's closed. So you're <coughs> now. Make sure when you're saying the the chet, it's from the back. It is a guttural. It's from the back of the throat, and it's like you're okay. You're hocking something up, so to speak. You're clearing your throat. <coughs> When you hear Israelis talking, you will hear a lot of <coughs> going on. Because it is a very common, whenever it is a form of, we'll get to it when we get there, uh, with the cough. 
it is a form of saying you or your second person possessive. For example, today's parasha was shalach lecha. Shalach lecha. You send, for you to send. Lecha to you. In other words, God is saying, this is my instruction to you. You sent. Uh, so whenever you see that K-H-A at the end of a, a Hebrew word, Betecha, Torah Techa, that is second person possessive, your house. Your Torah, the Cha signifies it's a it's a suffix that is added on to a Hebrew noun to give it second person possessive. I'm first person, you're second person, they are third person. Okay, so I'm first person, you is second person, he or she is third person. Okay, I know I'm taking you some of you back like 40 or 50 years, but anyway. Okay, so so second person possessive, meaning pertaining to you. It is yours. So your house, your Torah. All right. So so make sure that you when you're reading Torah, make sure that you're careful is that a hit or is it a hit? Now, sometimes, sometimes they are used interchangeably. Particular, particularly in the Orthodox community, when they don't want to say certain words and certain names, they will change it slightly. They will change the he to a chet. For example, instead of saying Elohim, they will say Elohim. This way they are not they are not dishonoring the Holy One. Instead of saying Yud He Vav He, they will say Yud He Vav He. So that they're not even pronouncing the letters properly of the sacred name. This is how far they're trying to keep from not taking his name in vain. We don't go that far. Okay, because Cito's famous, Cito's most favorite line is, it is what it is. It is a UK of him, and we deal with it. We don't speak the name, but we describe the name. Okay, so uh, the same is true with Elohim. Um, we don't say Elohim. Now, sometimes you'll hear, especially when we get going in the liturgy, afterwards it's hard for me to change. So when we have a lot of going on, I'll keep going. So a lot of times my Elohim comes out Elohim. But you will hear also Israelis doing that. When they get to talking fast or whatever, the He and the Chet kind of like blend. Okay? So... Just, but understand when you're reading it, why? Because it changes the significance, open throat, closed throat, open life, closed life. You're going to see. So, he, everyone say, signifies breath. Particularly, the breath of God. This is the breath of God. Now, remember, every Hebrew letter is, has its neighbors for a reason. Every Hebrew letter is where it is because it has a relationship to the letter on either side of it. 
He is between Dalit and Vav. Therefore, Vav is the number of man. Dalit is the poor man. We're talking about humanity here. <sighs> humanity. We're talking about humanity. <sighs> Breath. Breathe, man. Why? Well, first of all, it represents the divine breath, Psalm 33, 6. By Adonai's words were the heaven made, and all their hosts by the breath of his mouth. Saying what? God breathed out the universe. He breathed it into existence. Here's the, cool, here's the coolest part of it all. Remember I said, <sighs> and it comes between Dalit and Vav. <sighs> We're talking about humanity. This is all about humanity. Are you ready? And God... <sighs> into the nostrils of Adam, and he became a living soul. God breathed into the nostrils of Adam, and he became a living soul. Genesis chapter 1. You remember that just before his ascension, Yeshua does the same thing to the Talmud. The book of John and Yeshua blew onto his Talmudim and said to them, Receive the Ruach HaKadosh, the breath of life. The rabbis tell us that it was when God breathed on Adam that God gave to Adam transcendency. What does it mean, transcend? What does that mean? To go up, go to the, another level. Why does it say, why do they say that it gave to Adam transcendency? Because they are made of flesh and blood and bone, and we are made of flesh and blood and bone, the animals. You see, this is why it is mistaken that we are simply intelligent apes. Because we have very similar appearances, very similar DNA to all the rest of animal life, to all the rest of the mammals. This is why the fallen human tries to elevate the animal, even above the human. Animal rights, that, animal, that the animal is more important than the human. You'll hear that that we should all just die off and leave the planet to the rest of the animals. But you see, when God breathed into Adam the breath of life, he became a living soul. This is the transcendency. This is the elevation that he has within in him, not just air, but the breath of God himself. My life is not that of an animal. And in fact, it is my responsibility to throw off as much as possible the animalistic 
inclination. To be elevated to that of the spiritual plane. I follow the animal nature that is created within me so much as it is to keep this body alive and to reproduce. But always in a controlled and holy way. Otherwise, I throw off the animal inclination. The nefesh bechama you hear me speak about. So that I may ascend, transcend to a higher level. Well, it was God who first did that. It was God who elevated mankind by two means. One, for all the rest of creation, it was by the word of his mouth. So when God created the lions and tigers and bears, oh my, he simply spoke them into existence. Let the earth bring forth all manner of mammals, four-footed walking beasts such as this. But when it comes to Adam, human, it says he formed him out of the clay of the earth. So the human is the only creature of which God took a hands-on approach, literally. And then he caused man to transcend. He elevated man up above all the rest of the animals by breathing into him the breath of life. Now, the Hebrew says that the, 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 the Torah states that every all animals have nefesh chayim, have a living soul. but it is only man who received this direct link of the breath of God. Saying, you're special. Yeshua said, if the Father cares so much for the sparrow, how much more does he care for you? Saying, God loves you more than he loves your cat. So, you remember the story of Avram and Sarai. Don't go there yet. You remember the story of Avram and Sarai. Aleph, Be, Resh, Mem. Avram. Sin, Resh. Sarah. Sarai, Sin Resh, maybe a Yud there, Sin Resh Yud. They're old. And I mean old, like my mom's 99 years old. She is stooped over, hunched over. She shakes when she can barely walk. She has to have assistance. She has to have help. I mean, she is like, very fragile. Adam and Sarai, Abram and Sarai. He's a hundred. She's eighty-nine. And God comes along and says, "Guess what? You're pregnant. You're gonna have a baby." And Sarai says, <laughs> I don't think so. He can't even get frisky anymore. That's what she did. She accused him. She says, he doesn't have it in him. 
at me, I'm well past my childbearing years. And God asks them, is there anything too difficult for me? And then, he added a he, and Avram became Avraham. And he took Sarai, and he changed the yud to a he, and she, went, she became Sarah. What did he do? In changing their names, you see, it was more than just changing them. Why did he change that? It was more than just changing their names. He was, exp he was showing them. He had breathed into them his breath, and they once again became living souls. They became young again. And that's what the rabbis say. That he became a frisky young man, and, and she became a cute young lady. So young that she was catching everybody's eye, including Pharaoh. She's in her old age. And she's like a beauty queen. And he's in his old age and he's like a young man. God breathed into them. Life. You see the Dalit. The reason why the haze between the Dalit is a vibe that is bent over. And, and now the vibe is standing up straight. The head teaches us to allow God to breathe life into our souls. That when your life is bent over and hurting and you've been humbled, should I say humiliated, and you're broken, God comes along and he breathes into you the breath of and I know what I'm talking about because four years ago I was a broken man bent over in pain could not even walk or get out of bed look at me today God can do powerful things you can only believe only believe. He took a lump of clay laying there on the ground. God leaned down, stooped to the level of that lump of clay. <laughs> Breathed life into it. And that lump of clay transcended all the rest of creation. He breathed into Avram his breath and Avram became a young man. He breathed into Sarai his breath and she became a beautiful woman. Young. Yeah. able to produce a child. Go back if you would when you get home this afternoon and read Hebrews chapter 11. And feel the yearning in their heart, childless and old. And so desperate that she would give to Avram another woman to impregnate. And then take that woman in her, in the birthing of the child and set that woman on her lap and the child to drop into her lap 
so that she could claim that child as her own. But God said, that's not what I was talking about. You're going to have a child. You shall bear a son. That is the hey. And so if, go like three, John chapter 10, verse 10. Yeshua said, I have come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. You see, that's what the breath of God does. It brings abundancy. You're already alive. Adam was already alive, but so are the animals. What makes you any different from the animals? That he breathes into you the breath of life. So that you will become abundant. So that you're not just living. You see, they're just living by instinct. And that's all the pleasure they have and all the pleasure they know is instinctual. Everything they do, they do by means they do through instinct. They're not thinking it out. They don't think about repercussions, what's going to happen. They're just living instinct. But God has elevated you. So that it's not just by instinct. Yes, you have instincts, but you overcome the instincts and you transcend those instincts to become spiritual in nature, in heart, in mind, in soul. And that's what causes you to have an abundant life. You see, a dog doesn't sit there and think out, well, I'm going to do this, and because I do this, this is going to happen. He just does it. That's why you see so many of them dead on the road. That's all instinct. That's what it is. They chase cars by instinct. I have a rat terrier. Her name's Pumpkin, because she reminds me of Pumpkin Spice. She's that orange-brown color, you know. She's a cute dog, very, very smart. She has two big problems. She was bred to chase rats. That thus the name Rat Terrier. So she loves to dig. She digs holes. Why? Because that's her instinct to go after the rat, because the rat is in the ground. So she likes to dig holes everywhere. Except where she's supposed to dig, because you see, my sister bought like one of those plastic swimming pools, filled it up with dirt, told her, dig here. She refuses to dig in that thing. She will dig everywhere else, but she will not dig where she's supposed to dig. The other thing she likes to do because she's bred to do it is chase. She loves to chase. So when she gets out and she sees a car, she loves the chase. But she is not transcended. Saying, when the instinct kicks in, she's not thinking about the results. She's thinking about the instinct. That's it. That's as far as her thought process goes. You're different. You have the ability to relate. You have the, bil the ability to think things through.
And that's what gives us pause. That's what should give you pause. When, as Cedar was speaking this morning, the temptation to sin comes about. What will the result, not just what is the immediacy of the now, that's the animal instinct. But the human will say, what will be the results of this action? And what will it do here? Now the pictograph has man, a man standing with his hands up and he's saying, hey, everybody do it. Hey, hey. come on, you can do better than that. Hey, hey, hey yo, hey, yo. Anyway, all right. Nick. So because he says he ne, okay, he, nun, he, he ne. He, e, n, e, this is E, I, he, sound, he, ne. Everyone say, he, ne. He, ne, ma, to, vo, ma, na, him, she, ve, ra, him, da, ham, ya, ka, he, ne. So that's when you're singing, when we sing, he, ne, that's what, this is what, this is what Ishiahu, Isaiah, the prophet, said to, Hashem, when he said, whom shall we send and who will go for us? And he said, Hine, Anochi, Hine, look, behold, that's the word, behold. He said, Hine, Anochi, look, literally, look at me. It's like the old baseball song, here I am, coach, send me in. I want to play center field. Y'all don't know that song? Never been to a baseball game. Here I am, coach, put me in. I want to play center field. Me, they put me out in left field. For this the way, the better. All right. So, hine means, behold, it's a man who is marveling at the wonders of God. Wow. You ever do that? You see something fantastic and you just go, wow. Kine. Look. Look at that. Especially when the sun is setting. And the sky is turning all shades of pink and orange and red and yellow and blue and purple. And you're like, in hey, hey. Look at that. Wow. You see, Hine begins a new a new chapter. Hine, the old man, bent over, stooped down. Behold, I make all things new. <sighs> he breathes into you the breath of life, and you stand up. And you begin, we take on ourselves. What did God do with Avram? He gave him a new name. Sita was just announcing this morning that our ladies, that some of our ladies who have taken new names, where do we get that from? The story of Avraham and Sarah. When God gave to them a new name. Why? Because they became born again. That's not a church term. That's not a Christian term. That's a Jewish term. They became born anew. Saying what? They, he reversed their age. To where they were no longer 190. They were like 30 and 20. I wonder if when we see the New Jerusalem, we're not just going to say, would you look at that? Wow, would you look at that? Do 
God caused Abraham and Sarah to go. They were limited in what they were able to do. Not only were they, she was already not able to bear children, and now they're in their old age where they're beyond the age of bearing children. But you see, when God gets involved, he takes away limitations. God gave to Adam, Adam, the human, the ability to arise above his limitations. Why? Well, first of all, he, just, he started out as a pile of clay. I can't do anything with that. What are you going to do with that? What can a pile of clay do? Of its own accord, nothing. It's just a pile of clay. But in the hands of an excellent potter, that clay becomes a very useful vessel. And in the hands of God, that, that pile of clay became a body flesh and blood and bones it became alive and then on top of that he breathes into it the breath of life and that pot of clay arises above its limitations more than just an animal now becomes a creature with the very breath of God inside By the way, this is the significance of when God says to him, the day that you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. And the rabbis say, but he didn't die that day. Yes, he did. Because you see, he exhaled. The day he was born, the day he was created, he inhaled. The day he fell, he lost it. So now, next slide, as a prefix, okay, we're going to go to number five. Go ahead, keep going. So, he, the he is a, is a prefix added on when, it's act, when, it, when you see it at the beginning of the word. It is usually a prefix, the direct article, all right? The direct article, the. Direct versus indirect. Indirect is a or an. So, a chair, which means what? any chair, as opposed to the chair, which means a specific chair. Okay, so uh, if it starts with a vowel, it would be an, an apple. You may have an apple. That's indirect, meaning what? If I tell you, you may have an apple, I'm saying what? Any apple. But if I tell you, you may have the apple, what? Now I'm talking specifically. That's called direct. Indirect. A or an, and an are indirect articles. The, the, a and an and the are called articles. A and an are indirect articles. The is a direct article. Okay? So, ha is the direct article, the, in English. In Hebrew, there is no indirect article. It does. There's no indirect article. It either has an article or it doesn't. It either has the direct article, ha. If it does not have the word ha in front of it, then it is by nature indirect, anyone. So for an, example of, an example of the direct article being used is, would be, Trying to remember how to write it. It's been a while. Ha Torah. 
So Ha Torah. Can y'all see that? So this is Ha A T O R A. Ha Torah. The Torah. This is the direct article, the, giving it specificity, this specific Torah. Okay? So when you see ha as a prefix to a noun in Hebrew, you will see it frequently. Pay attention when we're going through the liturgy. These things will start making sense to you and you will start recognizing things. When you see ha, ha Torah, ha sefer, the scroll, ha aron, the ark, ha beit ha migdash, the house, the, the, uh, um, the place, ha kodesh, the holy one. When you see ha, when you hear ha, it means the. Very simple, the. So ha means, ha means, ha means the. So, homework assignment. Go home. If you have a, if you have a, a sidur at home, start looking at your sidur. If you don't have a sidur, they have them online. Go to Hebrew pages online, see where you can find the ha. Locate all the direct articles that you can find. You'll start recognizing them. As a suffix, as a suffix, he feminizes. What's a suffix? A prefix goes at the beginning of a word. So if it's at the beginning, and here you have both, if it's at the beginning of the word, it is the direct article or definite article. If it's at the end, such as sad versus sara. This is sar. What does sar mean? Prince. So if it comes as a Suffix at the end of a word, it turns it feminine. He feminizes a word, a noun. Hebrew is not a, like in English. English, you can have any ending and it can be male or female, whatever. It's whatever you make it to be. I guess that's why we have so much trouble today. Uh, it is whatever, you know, you make it whatever to be. In Spanish, it's specific, right? O is masculine, A is feminine. In Hebrew, H, P is feminine. When you put a H at the end of a noun, it turns it feminine. Thus, Torah is masculine or feminine? Feminine. So, a little ditty that my rabbi taught me that was teaching me how to speak Hebrew, and this will help you. Get rid of this germ for a little while. We're almost done.
So what this is, is reading backwards, remember. Right to left. Who is he? He is she. This is how you remember your identity pronouns. Who means he. Who means he. He means she in Hebrew. So wherever you say, Bri, who, you're saying, blessed is he. Bri, who. He means she. Who means he, he means she. So let's say that. Who means he, he means she. Who means he, he means she. Who means he, he means she. One more time. Who means he, he means she. So who means? He means. She means. He means. She. <laughs> Tricked you. He means she. Who means he, he means she. So wherever you see the who, that means he. And we'll learn uh, masculine possessive. Just as in Spanish, Hebrew, everything is either masculine or feminine. There is no neuter. Because ah, feminizes the Ruach HaKodesh is seen in feminine form. Breath is feminine. In Christianity, the Holy Spirit is seen as masculine. In Judaism, feminine, it's the Shekhinah, it's the bride. By the way, so Shekhinah, What? Means the presence, but it's in feminine form. Ruach, the chet, is feminine form. All right. So, uh, we're going to skip over, we're going to close five levels of the soul. I'll give you a chance to just write it down very quickly. Five levels of the soul. Nefesh, which are the nefesh, when we talk about nefesh, that's your instinct. When you say ruach, you're talking about the spirit. When you're talking about the, the neshama, is the mind, the way you think. Then the chaya. This is the ability to transcend, to rise up, okay? When you get up in the morning, chayim, you're transcending, you're arising. They say that sleep is 199th part of death. You die just a little bit when you're asleep. In fact, in, in Kabbalistic Judaism, it is believed that the soul actually leaves the body. That's why you dream and it travels around, which is why you say the Modeani in the morning. Because if your soul didn't come back, <laughs> your soul's out there wandering around and forgets to come home, you don't wake up in the morning. So we say, We are grateful before you, living and eternal King, for in mercy you have restored my soul within me. Great is your faithfulness. You, you brought me back. And then the Yachida, the oneness, the unity. Yachid is where we get our, it's from Echad, that God is one. And yet one does not necessarily mean one. Literally, it means unity. Echad. So when you have, for example, a husband and wife, 
who there too, Torah says, become one, become echad. They become a duality. Singular, yet pluralistic. Dualistic. We say that God is one, yes. But he has many attributes. Which are the summation of the singularity. Which is why I read to you what I read to you earlier. What can be done to the Shekhinah can also be done with other attributes. So if he can clothe himself in fire and cloud in order to reveal himself to mankind, he can also clothe himself in a human body to reveal himself to mankind. So, the number five. Hey, the number five. This is the, the gematria, number five. Why? There are five levels of the soul. The nefesh, the roach, the neshama, the chaya, the yechida. So, they're coming up levels. You're transcending. You're growing. You start off nefesh, instinct. This is the baby. Babies live on instinct. As you nourish them, roach, they begin to grow and mature. Neshama, their mind begins to expand. They begin to learn. Chaya. They begin to live. Caribou. Kara's going to turn five next week. And she's growing. I tell her, stop. No more. You can't, you can't grow anymore. You're not allowed. You have to stay. That's horrible. Fine. Because... We love their simplicity, we love their innocence. The innocence and the simplicity of a child. This is why Yeshua said what? Except you come to me as a child. What? In simplicity and innocence. Well, and I were talking yesterday. Nehemiah. That kid has such a vocabulary. He's only three years old. Right? Three. My goodness. He'll talk your ear off. And he uses big... He, they take him to the... They take... Uh, uh, my sister takes uh, Kara and, and Neo to the library every Tuesday. They have children's time. Now they're, so other children, homeschoolers, whatever, they all come to the library. Nehemiah, three years old, told the librarian that he wanted that he wanted to see what a certain dinosaur looked like and he used the official name of the dinosaur. She had no idea what he was talking about. She went and looked it up and he had said it right. And when he saw it, he pointed it out to her. That's this, the Neshama, the mind. Chaya, the ability to transcend. Yachida, the ability to become so mature that you're able to unite with the Messiah. That you're on the same level. This is what it means to pray in his name. You want your prayers answered? Pray at that level. That's how you get your prayers answered. Next. There are five books of Torah. He. Torah is the word of life, as we talked about last week, talking about the menorah. Torah is the word of life. It's the breath. Through the Ruach HaKodesh, this is why they came on the same day. Shavuot, Pentecost, this is why they came on the same day. The Torah and the Ruach HaKodesh. Why? Because the Ruach HaKodesh gives us the ability, breathes Torah into us, inscribes the Torah on your heart. And that's how you're able to live it. The Torah is formed from the Dalit and the Yud. The He, excuse me, the He is formed 
from the Dalit and the Yid. Go back to the to the head. Go back one page, please. All the way back. Oh. So you can see up there. Remember the Dalit? There's the Dalit. And what? A Yud. A hand. Yud means hand. Saying what? Okay, go back. Go. The poor man sanctifying the world with his actions. You can sanctify the world. You can make the world a holy place. Even though you don't have anything. So Yeshua and the Talmudim were in the Beit HaMikdash. Standing there, he was standing there watching the people. And he sees the Purushim coming in and these men of wealth and means. They have princes and Kohanim and the royalty, all of this, and they're coming in and they have their escorts, they have their bodyguards, you know, they drive up in their in their Cadillacs, they drive up in their limousines and the, their doors are being opened by the Levim, you know, and they get out in their suits, you know, and, and they come walk in, they have their sunglasses on and they're looking around at the crowd and they're waving at people, you know, and they're coming into the day. Now, can I have your autograph? Oh, they're giving their autograph and smiling and everything. Or they're saying, no, get away from me, quit bothering me, uh, you know. Uh, Tom, what's his name? Tom Hanks cussing out that, those kids because they... They pushed on his wife a little too hard in the airport. I don't know if you saw that, but anyway. Uh, so, you know, uh, and, and they come in, you know, and man, they get out their wallet, you know, and it's like this thick, and they have their credit cards, you know, and they say, well, honey, which one should we use today? You know, and they pull out a credit card, they take it up and they swipe it, or he pulls out a wad of cash, you know, and he's just looking around, yeah, look at the wad of cash I'm going to give. He throws it into the into the offering plate, you know, and, and he, you know, they're just, just this whole parade is going on. And in the midst of all of that, there's this little old lady, a street beggar, dressed in rags, hunched over, shuffling along. And she shuffles. Up to the tzedakah box. And she pulls out that little coin purse. And she pops it open. And she's standing there and she pops it open while all this is going on around her. And Yeshua's watching her. Yeshua's just standing there watching her. He knew. He tells the Talmudim, he tells the disciples, look, watch, look at her, look. And she pops open that coin purse. She reaches her two fingers in. And she pulls out a half a penny. A half a penny. The lowest coin you can have. It's actually been a penny, but it's called coin clipping, where they clip off parts of it and weigh it out to pay their bills. And this, all she's got left of this is a half a penny. And she says, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of vision, the universe. Who has brought us to this time and given me the opportunity to be here in this moment? And she drops the half a penny in the Tzedaka box. She turns around and she shuffles away. Undoubtedly, nobody else saw her, but Yeshua saw her. He turns to his Talmudim and he says, you see all these people giving out of their wealth, their prosperity. 
Who's giving more? Her? Him, them? Or her? Because she did not give out of her wealth. She gave out of her need. Saying what? He's telling them. You see, when you have and you give, you have it to give it. So it doesn't hurt, so to speak. What I'm saying is, you have it to spare, so you give it. That does not mean as much as someone who cannot spare it, and yet they give it. That's all she had. When she walked away from the tzedakah box, she's broke. That's it. She's broke. She has nothing to go back on. She has nothing. You see, the rich people, when they were giving, they had more money they could fall back on. This was not that much to them. They weren't going to die doing this. They had to spare. What Yeshua was pointing out to them was she had nothing to spare. Who was giving more? Oh, they were giving more physically. But she was investing more emotionally and spiritually because she was giving everything she had and there was nothing left to give. Thus Yeshua says, blessed are those who give in their need saying even when we are poor we can help with tikkun hala we can help with the reparation of the world we can do our part every person is required to give their tithe whether you make $15 an hour or you make $100 an hour. Every person is required to give their time. Every person is required to do their part. That is the hey. That is life. Life is taking a chance on God and putting yourself out there. And letting him say, live abundantly. Live abundantly. So with this we close. Kine. Kine, keep going all the way. Beholding God, behold. Look to God. Beholding Mashiach. Beholding the potential, behold. Haha. <laughs> this is what Pilate said concerning Yeshua during the trial. Behold the man. There's an old hymn that quotes the scripture. It says, I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. A message unto you I give. I have a message from the Lord, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. The Imru? Amen. Class is dismissed. Did you have a question? Any questions? All right. Class is dismissed. We'll be back in two weeks and we will do Vav.